Okay, so we are live. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to Shifts to Success Live. Um, as you can tell, here recently we've been doing lots of interviews from uh, people who have joined Shifts to Success and they're going to be sharing their story of uh, how they've found their career working in the public sector, but also their business journey. And they're going to be giving lots of uh, knowledge bombs as we go along. And today we're joined by a remarkable man. Uh, he's been with Shifts to Success less than uh, six months. And he's going to be sharing his journey from the public sector to now becoming an entrepreneur. So without any further ado, James Taylor, how are you? Hi, uh, Alex. Nice to be here. Thanks for them inviting me on. No problem at all. No problem. So uh, what we like to start off by with these kind of podcasts, these kind of live streams is to find out more about you. And I want to bring it right back to when you was a child. So what was kind of... Um, what was kind of childhood like for you? Was you academic? Was you naughty? You know, did you go to school? What was your upbringing like? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm the youngest of five kids. I'm the youngest by 10 years. Wow. And I worked out on my birthday, I worked out what date I must have been conceived on. And I, I, if I worked it out, it was in New Year's Eve. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think my mum and dad were having a celebration and, and along in October. I, I came along... Um, I wouldn't say I was a particularly nosy kid. I say I've always been a bit of a chatty kind of person that probably chatted too much. Um, but I was always fascinated with how things worked. It wasn't really enough for me to just to accept this is just the way things work. I wanted to figure out, well, what's behind that? Why does that work like that? Was, was you one of those kids who go, but why? But why? Was you always asking why things worked and yeah. why the world was? Yeah, and I, um, <laughs> and I remember hearing a lot because it is <laughs> <laughs> amazing stuff. Um, so, what was it kind of growing up? You obviously went to school. Um, did you go to secondary school? Did you go to college or university or anything like that? Um, well, being the youngest of five, I was a bit of a sheep, really. Mm -hmm. And the, the rule in my house or the message in my house growing up was: you leave school as soon as possible, you get a job, and you start earning money. So that's what all the others did, and that's what I did too. Amazing. Okay. And what kind of, what was your first job? What was the first kind of bit of money you earned? It was, um, well, I had a little side hustle going on in the summer holidays when I was younger, washing cars. Yeah. Um, and that was for a bit of extra pocket money. But when I actually left school, the first job was a gardener for the city council, and as you can probably tell, uh, in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amazing. And then I, um, I did that for a few years. And then the chance came up to become a tree surgeon, which I loved. And the interview was bizarre because well, part of the interview was you had to climb a tree. It was brilliant. Really? Wow. But yeah, do you reckon that would go down in today's day and age of health and safety? <laughs> it was great. You know, it's, uh, I've never had an interview like that before. Amazing. Um, so how old are you this period? When, you, For example, the tree surgeon stuff, how old were you then? So um, I would have been if I was 21 then. 21 right okay awesome stuff so where did the police come from because you've got a, a long career in the police 23 years um yeah. well, first of all why the police and how did that come about you joining the police um i knew that there was more to me than what i was doing okay um i liked the street sage inside of business because i was out in the fresh air um climbing trees all day cutting them down loads of physical exercise but it just, it wasn't mentally stretching me. And I thought, well, I haven't gone to university. I haven't gone to college, but I want to learn. I want to, I want to do more and be more than what I presently am. Yeah. And one of my brothers at the time was in the firearms team in Cumbria Police. Okay. And he said, why don't you consider the police? It's a great, this is 20 years ago. He was saying it was yeah. a great job. Um, and Heartbeat was on the TV at the time. So I totally remember that. <laughs> I, I do, I do remember Heartbeat. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I still had memories like the Sweeney and Starsky and Hutch and Chips. And I thought, you know, I've never even considered this, but he seems to like it and he's older and wiser than me. So maybe this is worth a shot. So I applied uh, for the police. Nice. And what kind of force did you go to? Was it, was it Met, you said, Metropolitan Police? Or? Yeah. I mean, bearing in mind I wanted the Heartbeat kind of <laughs> lifestyle, I ended yeah. up on the Met. Yeah. Um, I was married at the time, had two young children, and my then wife was getting very homesick to shoes on Liverpool. So the deal was I was going to transfer out the mess to GMP. The strange thing was Liverpool seemed quite big to me mm. until I moved away. Mm. And when I used to go back, it seemed quite small. And I didn't really want to be 
policing on my own doorstep because mm. it seems so small. So I transferred to GMP. I was only there two months and realized I absolutely detested it. Why, why is that? Why, why did you test it? What was it about GMP? Um, if I, well, I'd probably say um, unethical and unprofessional. Mm. I'd okay. probably be happy to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. okay. So after the, after no offense to anyone who's GMP from watching this, this was 20 years ago. Yeah. So after two months in, I thought I've got to leave the police because my wife was at the time was happy back in Liverpool because that's where we were living in the mm-hmm. in-laws. Mm-hmm. And I thought I can't do this. This I can't, I won't, I won't police this way. This is not how I am. Mm-hmm. Um I hate bullies. Yeah. I hate them. And you ask me why I joined the police. That's one of the reasons. It's yeah. it's cheesy, but it's true. I hate bullies. Yeah. So um, luckily enough, um, I was back in the Met within one day short of six months of leaving. They hadn't even processed the paperwork for me going, and I was back in the Met. Wow. Okay. So essentially you went to GMP, and then you went back to the Met. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, what do you find, you know, because you've obviously worked in different forces, is it so when I speak to police officers, I hear kind of the same problems across the board, you know, even fact you've got a German police officer with us and yeah. you know she's got the same problems as the UK cops. So with regards to culture from GMP to the Met, is there a difference in culture? Or would you say it was just a particular individuals that really you didn't like in GMP? Um, there was definitely a different culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I expected it to be very similar. And the reason I went to GMP, because it was right next door to Merseyside, so I could commute. Mm -hmm. And I'm not too sure whether it is now, but at the time, it was the biggest police force. It was called the force back there instead of a service. Mm -hmm. It was the biggest police force outside the Met. So I thought, this has got to be decent. Mm -hmm. And um, what I found throughout was that there was a general feeling that anyone who was in the Met was dodgy. Right, okay. They were, all, they were all corrupt cops, you know. Dodgy Daves. Yeah, and, and I got accused of that a few times. And I was like, no, this really happened. You know, mm. it's, um, I'm, I'm not verbaling no one up here. This is just the way things have happened. Yeah. And it was, um, and it was just a, a huge lack of um, knowledge. And I think I was spoiled because I've come from the mess. It was all big and shiny and meant to be the best, you know. Mm. Um, I don't know whether that's true, looking in hindsight. Mm. But, I was all still rose tinted glasses, all shiny and new, and this is amazing. Wow. Okay. Um, so just to backtrack, you've gone to um, the Met, then GMP, um, because wife was getting homesick. You've gone yeah. back to the Met. So how many years are you in now by the time you go back to the Met? Um, I was in about the five-year okay. service. Okay. Early. Awesome. And five years, you know, obviously five years into 23 years, which you kind of uh, left, yeah. you know, what kind of, what kind of roles did you have in, in those 23 years? Uh, now you're back at the Met. Um, well, I started out like everyone does start off on team. Mm-hmm. So it was a uniform team. And then it was during my probation when they give you attachments to different departments. Mm-hmm. Um, I just loved being on the team. I thought that I'll never want to change. And it wasn't until I did my attachment with the CID. Mm. And I thought, well, this is quite nice. Mm. Because they put me with, um, I was working with different guys each day. And there was a scout bloke there at the time. And he sort of like took me under his wing a little bit, fellow mm. scouser, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, and we, we, I helped him. Well, I didn't really help. I just watched what he was doing. And it was like going off the border. There was prison visits. Um, mm. It was, you know, just even going off off to a different borough was a big thing. This is how naive and shiny I was. This is this is wonderful, you know. Um, <laughs> and I found I liked the idea of the first name terms within the CID. I liked the idea that you saw the job through to the end instead mm. of having to hand it over, which I was never really a fan of. Mm. Um, and I liked the friendship and the banter. Um, but also I was very, very fortunate because within the CID at that time, there was some really, really excellent... Uh, coppers mm. and you know put them all together you had a, a formidable force going on and mm. I like that and I think I like being around that kind of environment awesome also kind of a high performing environment right yeah and they were all they were all very very good at what they did yeah I like that awesome awesome stuff okay so it sounds like you're in a good place 
at the, at, you know, this time in the police. Yeah. Why did you start thinking about business then? Obviously, you're about 23 years in the minute. Um, you know, we're fast forward now, you're kind of enjoying the job. What kind of made you have a change of heart and why did you even think about a different career? Um, that's a really good question. You know, they say, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty vision. Mm. It really is me. And when I look back, I can see all the little breadcrumbs. But when I was in it, I just couldn't see it. Mm. And I, there was a number of things that happened at once. So around about the 10-year period, um, my marriage started to break down. And effectively, I fell out of love with my wife. Okay. And at the same time in the police, um, the rose tinted glasses were starting to come off a little bit. Mm. because I was, you know, I sort of like knew what I was doing and I gained skills in different areas. And I was starting to see things for how they really were. Mm. So I started to see the focus from senior management on figures and spreadsheets and targets. Mm. And I didn't join the police to fill out a spreadsheet. Mm. You know, I, I joined, as I say, because one of the reasons I hate bullies. And I didn't like the focus being on that when I thought personally, the focus should be on the person you're trying to help. Um, and that's never left me, really. So the rose tinted glasses are coming off. And I was also seeing barristers doing a deal outside the court. Wow. And, um, you know, we'll plead to this. Will you guys accept that? And then asking me to try and sell that option mm. to the, for the victim. Mm. And, um, or they would try and say it in a certain way we're thinking of doing this, this is for the best. Mm. And, I, and it just stuck on my throat, yeah. really. And then when, um, if, if, that, if that happened outside, of course, if I was working with the victim and I'd been working with the victim for a few months, it was the first time I felt like I was lying to them. Mm. Because it didn't, I, what I wanted to say was, that's bloody horrendous. You know, they just cut a deal outside course because neither of them could be bothered. You've looked at the case for half a day. And, and I was invested in, Trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. Yeah. And it just stuck in my throat. And I thought, this is, and I never thought anyone really got sentenced long enough. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, whether it was victims were members of the public or victims were police and it was assaults. I never thought the sentences were long enough. No. And, and that's something I hear, you know, a lot of people have a massive job on and it goes to court and they're just, the, yeah, the sentence isn't long enough and they feel deflated, right? They've done all this work. They've yeah. feel like they made a difference, but they're just, yeah, the, the service, the length of um, yeah, imprisonment is, isn't enough, unfortunately. Um, how, how does that make you, did it make you feel inflated? Did it make you feel frustrated? Because you're doing all this amazing police work and then you pass off to the courts and they just may, you know, don't do kind of the same stuff that you'd hoped them to do. Yeah, I was, I was disappointed in the system, to be mm. fair. Um, I was disappointed at the time. There was a lot more paperwork than there is now. It was, the paperwork was ridiculous. Mm. And the hoops that you had to jump through, you'd almost have to have a trial uh, before a person got charged to justify them getting charged. Wow. And, it was, and some of the approaches was, it was almost looking for reasons not to charge. And some of the areas I worked in as well, the victim had a very troubled past mm. because of their own upbringing, whatever it might be. And that, sadly, um, was sometimes used as a reason not to charge when, and I think, well, of course, the, the, of course they're vulnerable. Yeah. Because of all this stuff, they shouldn't be punished again. You know, the whole thing just wasn't sitting. Yeah. And that was after about 10 years. Okay, okay. So um, for those who, you know, just let me just give you a backtrack. So essentially, you've, you fell out in love with your wife. Um, you, do you get divorced at this point or... Do you uh, just go separate ways or? Um, first of all, I had to become aware of how I was feeling. Yep, yep. Um, and then I had to, I sat on that for a while mm -hmm. thinking, what am I going to do? I was like at that crossroads, you know, do I say something? Once it's said, you can't unsay it. Yes. And in the end, I thought, I can't do this. So I, um, so I told my wife that I wanted to get a divorce. Okay. And this was how I fell it. And this is truly how I fell into my, career now mm. because what I did was I arranged um, I arranged counselling or occupational health within the police mm -hmm. because I knew one of the problems in our marriage was a lack of communication yeah yeah and I knew that with me saying this she was probably going to communicate with me even less 
Okay, okay. So I arranged councilmen, not mm -hmm. for us to get back together, to keep us talking because we had stuff to sort out because at that time, I now had three children with it. Yeah. Um, you know, it was what's going to happen next. What's, what's the, let's work out a plan. Yeah. So I arranged council um, and she came to the first session um, never came back for the second. Okay. And the councillor said to me, look, when people normally come as a, as a couple, even though you're not a couple, they come as a team. Um, if one falls by the wayside, I can't really carry on with the other one because if the first person wants to engage again, they now think we're mates. Mm. She said, but I don't think she's ever going to come back and you're entitled to uh, however many sessions it was. So if you would like them, I'll work with you if you want to work with me. And I hadn't considered that at all. I'd oh. gone into the council thing for a totally different agenda, really. Mm -hmm. And I thought, do you know what? This is probably going to be a bit of a stressful time for me. It might be good to talk it through. So I said, yes. And then I had my counseling sessions with this woman called uh, uh, Glynis. It was brilliant. Amazing. Is that how you, you first had um, kind of a first experience in that kind of that world? And you felt like, oh, there might be something I enjoy here, like a, almost like a mini passion. It was, it was quite, it was quite surreal because um, many times I'd really engaged with the process, mm. and and it's strange as the as police we give ourselves to everyone else, yeah, but very rarely allow anyone to give to us. Mm. So that was quite a unique experience for me, and I had so many light bulbs moments where I felt quite stupid. Because when the light bulb went on in one of the sessions, you know, we don't pick something. And I go, oh, of course, of course, that's why that bothers me. You know, of course, that's why that pissed me off. Um, I felt quite stupid because it was so obvious. I thought, how did I not know that about me? Mm. I've been with me my entire life. How was that not clear? So at the same time as she was helping me, and I was disillusioned with the police, I was there was an undercurrent within myself thinking, what a good job you do. Mm. I'm really benefiting from this more than I ever thought. I'd, I'd never even considered it. You are, I, will, I would love to get that feeling back because I feel as if you're doing a great job. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So this experience that you went through was almost like a self-awareness for you in a reflective period in your life yeah. of these things that really weren't self-aware of before, right? Absolutely. Okay. Amazing. So at this point in your life, you, you're getting the divorce underway. Um, you're getting disillusioned in the job, the, the rose tinted uh, glasses. Yeah. And now you found this, this new interest, this new mm -hmm. you know, little spark that you've got involved in due to an opportunity with a counselor who's, who's working with you. Um, you then start to think about, well, you know, potentially I'd like to do this. Yeah. Uh, what made, cause obviously you left the police before we met, right? Before we met. Yes. Success. What happened in that situation? So you're disillusioned with the job. You've kind of, you, your values aren't alignment with them anymore. You've got this new interest. What happens next? Um, to be honest, I think it was a bit of procrastination on my part. I wanted to try and get my life in order mm. um, because the divorce went through um, and that took place. And then the police at the time was the only job I had. Mm. And it was sort of like, well, just throw myself into this. You know, just, just get busy with, with police work. Bury my head in the sand, really. But this feeling, what I've noticed about myself is if there's something I want to go for, as long as I'm not hurting anybody generally um, and I can afford it, I'm going for it. Mm. And sometimes I've got to hurt another like my ex-wife because I had to be true to myself. Of course, yeah. You know, this thing was so big within me that I couldn't, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't live the lie. Yeah. So a few years after me uh, and the counsellor finished our sessions, I sent in an email. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you won't remember me. Um, I'm one of many that you've seen. But I really benefited from our sessions. And it's been it got me thinking, if I wanted to do what you do, how would I go about that? Great question. And, um, and she was lovely. And she got in touch, you know, within the next day and said, oh, this is how I started. And here's some links to look at. And that was, that was me uh, off and running. Wow. Amazing. Um, for those who are listening, so you're a cop, you've got many years of experience, maybe even a, a little bit of institu uh, being institutionalized due to just being in the job for so long. Mm -hmm. You've gone through um, a life experience in itself in divorce. Yeah. You've now found this new interest. 
in your mind, I see a lot of people, you know, stay with their comfort zone because they're more fearful of the unknown, right? They, they don't want to pursue that business. They don't want to pursue that passion they have because what they know is the job, right? Mm -hmm. What makes you different? What I want to get inside your head. What makes you different to make that decision? Because, you know, did you build up your business alongside the job or did you just leave or why did you follow it when so many people are unhappy with the job like you were, but they stay? I, I, I think it, it's one of them breadcrumb moments where you can't see it at the time, but it's only when you look back. And I remember a few little things happen. And one of them was when I was a very small boy, if my dad was doing something, he was always doing DIY around the house. Mm. And I'd be a small boy and I'd be watching him. And I'd say, how, how do you do that? And he'd say, you just do it. And I'd say, yeah, but, but how do you do it? He'd say, just do it. And I remember being frustrated as a kid because I thought, you're not telling me anything. But now I'm older and wiser, I realised he was telling me everything. You just do it. Wow. And then he was, when I was working with the, on the garden side, all the new starters got put with a guy called Bob, who mm. was known as Grumpy Bob. <laughs> yeah. Because he was. Mm. And... Um, Everyone used to take the mickey out of him because he was grumpy. And I never used to. And um, and because I never used to, he would talk to me. And he would tell me all these things that he'd wanted to do. But then he'd tell me the reasons or the excuses why he hadn't. Mm. And I can still remember them to the day. One of them was um, he wanted to go skiing. But he said, no am I look. In fact, that was one of his phrases. No am I look. Mm. No am I look. I'll break my leg on the first day. Mm. And then he wants to go on a around the world cruise. No mile off the boat would sink. And he, and he couldn't swim. He's a very positive guy by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and another one was about the pyramids. And no one is lucky he would have got bitten to death by mosquitoes. And even though I was like straight out of school, working with grown men, knowing nothing about nothing, I was savvy enough to realise that Bob was very, very bitter. And a lot of the things he'd wanted to do them ships literally had sailed. And I thought to myself, I'm never going to end up like you. Mm. I'm never going to be like an old version of Bob, sitting on my deathbed, reminiscing about what I could have done. I'd rather know and fail than not, than not know. And, and that's why when I left, this, when I left the, uh, the city council, so many people were saying, you're crazy. No one left. Mm. You know, because you're not going to get sacked. It was a secure job. The wages were all right for what you were doing. Everyone was skiving off as much as they could. Hmm. But I just, I just thought, I can't do it. If there's something I want to do, I've got to go for it. It's just, I think it's a number of things, but that's just two off the top of my head. Yeah, no, I get it. I completely get it. It's like an itch you have to scratch, right? Yeah, to... I've got to. Yeah, you've got to know. I, I completely understand. Okay, so, you know, you obviously at this stage thinking about leaving the job. Um What's going through your mind? You're probably thinking about resonation at this point. Are you thinking about the pension? What's going to happen there? I'm a, you know, what's going through your mindset when you're literally thinking about, I've got to leave? Well, it took me a while to get to that point because I had to go and get trained up in what I do now. Yeah. Um, and that took a few years. Yeah. And um, when I learned something, then I realized, oh, I'm gone. There's something else I can learn that's going to make it even better. Mm. And then it was a case of, and there's something else. Mm. And I realized that I could stay in that trap, really. I can keep on learning and learning, but still doing the same job. Uh, I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> when, you, when you're reading, uh, for me, when I'm reading books, I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I, I didn't know that. And then what else don't I learn, uh, know? Yeah. And then I want to learn more. And it's this consumption mindset we get trapped in exactly the same. Sorry, carry on. So, so it took me a while to do it. And then I, um, I applied for compressed hours. So I didn't, because um, I didn't drop my money. I was still full time, but it gave me an extra day off in the week. And in that day off in the week, um, I got my, um, look, I was blindly going into it, really. But, you know, I got my business set up and I got my insurance and my website and this, you know, and thought, I'm in business. This is it. This is great. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Um, so obviously you're in business now and, um, how long, obviously you've been, took you quite a while to train up to do what you want to do. Did you hand in your resignation by person? Was it an email? Um, did you make sure you had customer or you've got a customer? Did you make sure you have enough money first or did you jump 
you know, sooner rather than later, despite your um, train that you went through? Um, I did a few things. I One of the first things was I came out of the pension. Great. Why did you uh, do that? So we, we've had some members do that, but <clears throat> why did you do it? Well, I knew I wasn't going to stay full time. I knew I wasn't going to stay for my 30 years. That was, that was certain. Mm -hmm. And I phoned up pensions branch and I said, look, if I go, and what would I get if I stayed in full time until the day I left? Or if I came out the pension now, what would I get? And it was something like £2,000 difference. Mm. And I thought, I'm coming out. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Very you know, assertive. And, um, and, it, and what I did was I would bank the money that I would have paid into my pension. I used to, I started putting that in a separate account. Mm. And I started building up a nest egg because I thought when I leave, the chances are I'm not going to be on the same money and this nest egg's going to get me through. Buffer. You know, yeah, my buffet, yeah. So I did that. Um, I, 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 I told my bosses, um, I told them over the phone, and then I confirmed it in an email. Mm. And then it was lots of, um, are you sure you're doing the right thing? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going. I'm so gone. Emotionally, I've gone. Yeah, amazing. And before, before I go on to my next question, actually, I want to ask this question. When you were telling people, this is what you're going to do, you're going to resign, and you got these questions that you were asked, is this the right thing you should yeah. be doing and so forth? How did that make you feel? Because there's a sheep mentality, not only in the police, there's a sheep mentality yeah. in the majority of you know, human beings' lives. We, we follow the crowd, right? And I've always yeah. been one for, you know, look at the mass and do the opposite. Right, because mm -hmm. the mass are miserable and they're unhappy with their roles. Yes, and they're not living true to themselves. So, with yourself, what's going on in your mindset when people are saying, "Are you sure this is the right thing to do? Are you, you know, are you certain?" Right? Did, did that did that deter you? Obviously, it didn't. But did it make you feel different at all, or did it make you more determined? Um, <laughs> I I got used to get it a lot. Um, are you sure you're doing the right thing? You know, what what if it doesn't work? What? If, and I think it's going to work. It's going to work because I'm. And I remember someone saying to me once, well the, "Well, the grass isn't always greener, is it?" Hmm. And I said, "It is if you water it." <laughs> that is amazing. So, that is uh, amazing. And I, I, I'm just that way inclined. I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'm not going to dip my toe. And I'm just, I'm going in, you know. And 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 I, and I'll sink or I'll swim, but I know I'm going. I'm going, I'm going to swim. That's amazing. Awesome stuff. So, um, as soon as you. Your resonations in. What's the first thing you do? Uh, <laughs> can I tell the story about the resignation? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Okay. And apologies if someone's caught the tree near where I am. I don't know if you can hear it. So, um, the, I promise you, every word of this is true. Mm -hmm. But in lockdown, I arranged to meet uh, my supervisor to hand my kit back, which isn't very much like uh, my body armor. This kind of stuff. Um, and I arranged to meet him at a different police station because it's closer to my home. And if there was ever any, if there was ever any doubt, which there wasn't, this <laughs> this has summed it all up really. So as I was driving into the underground car park at this police station near my home, by pure chance, uh, he and another uh, sergeant were in a car directly in front just by pure coincidence so we drove into the car park in the underground bay parked next to each other and he got out the car and he said um, don't forget i've got 23 years in i wasn't expecting no red carpet treatment but he said to him should we just do it here no point finding an office is there and i said okay so we opened up the boot of his car i opened up the boot of mine i put my bag in his boot it was like some kind of drugs deal going on <laughs> <laughs> basement car park I put my stuff in and me Warren card back two signatures okay see you then see ya and I drove out and I went home I had a cup of tea and I had a client booked that afternoon and I thought like straight in straight in <laughs> wow wow bloody hell you, you can imagine it's being a bit more formal than that I'd love that it's so informal amazing yeah <laughs> and I thought if that doesn't sum up um, because I don't, I used to love it. I, I used to think I can't believe I get paid so much money mm. to have such a good laugh with mm. such a great gang of people, mm. you know. And um, sadly, and I do say sadly because it was great fun. It mm. it, it, it was not the job I joined. Mm. Of course, and it changes. I, I right, I've got to go. I've got to go. 
kind of cool. Cool. Amazing. Amazing story as well. Um, so now I want to go on to kind of the business side of things. Um, first of all, how did you find out about me and Shift's success? I believe it was a Facebook advert. Okay. Um, and I thought, oh, that looks quite good because I'd never worked for myself before. And I was really flying by the seat of my pants, making mis business mistakes. I wasn't making client mistakes, so I knew what I was doing there. But business mistakes, I was making them all over the place. Hmm. And I, as a mentor of mine, he says, the worst kind of person is an unconscious incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> and I was. That was me. That was me. Yeah. And then um, I, I clicked on the advert, um, liked the look of what Shift of Success was all about. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it was a book that you were sending out, Police Officers to Entrepreneur. I thought, oh, I do like a good book. Yeah, I read it. It tied in with so many other things I've been reading about, mm. and I thought, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Really, this is uh, this is legit. And then we had a chat on the phone, and um, I think I was sound, I was sounding you out. I think you were sounding me out, and I thought I want in because this I'll, I'll stop being an unconscious incompetent. Mm. You know, join this firm. Amazing, yeah. awesome, great stuff. Okay. Um, now you do counseling, which is great. We'll go on to kind of the customers, kind of you help in a second, but you've also yeah. got a few other skill sets with you as well. Uh, you do hypnotherapy. Yeah. Um, and life coaching as well. Before I yeah. go on to um, life coaching stuff and more questions around that, talk to me about hypnotherapy. First of all, how would you summarize that? To, like, so an 11 year old couldn't understand. Okay. Um, it's not what you see on TV. Right. Okay. So it's not like sleep. No, no, it's, okay. it's not that. No one's eating an onion thinking it's an apple. <laughs> okay. No one's dancing like Elvis or Tina Turner. No one's doing that. Yeah. It's a completely natural thing that we do all the time without realizing what we're doing. Okay. And we put ourselves in a trance all the time. You do it when you're watching the TV mm -hmm. and you get engaged in a film. You do if you're reading a book. You do if you're sitting on a train and you're looking at, in fact, look out for this. If, when COVID ends and people are on, trains again all the time mm -hmm. you can see people putting themselves in a trance without knowing they are mm. they're looking out the window and you'll see that they're physically out the window but you can tell the mind's gone somewhere else they don't mm. blink you don't swallow the face loses color a little bit depending on how close you are you can see the pulse slowing down and the pupils can dilate and then when they bring themselves back to their own space the first thing they'll do is Blink, swallow, colour returns, look around and familiarise them. We do it all the time. Yeah. You know, and so hypnosis or hypnotherapy is, I love it. I love it because it's, and I got into that because I was a counsellor first. And sometimes with counselling, the clients were struggling to find resolve or an answer within themselves. And I'm a firm believer we've got the answer within ourselves to solve our own stuff mm. and I was thinking about this and this is where it goes back to me being a little boy wanting to know what's what's behind the next layer mm. and I was thinking about it and I was thinking well if the answer isn't with the client in the conscious part of the mind and it's within them maybe it's in the unconscious part of the mind mm. and then I started studying hypnotherapy and that's when I realized that everything we've ever learned without exception, is stored in our head. And it's mainly stored in the unconscious part of our mind. Amazing, amazing. You actually share, you just ring a bell now, you shared a story with me about your actually mind solves a problem whilst you're asleep and you wake up with the answers. Yes. Can you share you know, a story around that for me? Well, this is why sleep's so important. And this is why I think a lot of police officers suffer with stress because you work in shifts, you work in long hours, your body clock's all over the place. Um, you know, your adrenaline's kicking in, you might be eating junk food. You know, it, it, there's so many reasons why your sleep isn't normal. Mm. And it's so important because when it does, not only does your body repair itself, it starts to sort out all the stuff that's been going on. Mm. It's a bit like for the parents amongst us who've got, who've had small kids. The kids go for a sleep during the day. You can tidy up a bit. As soon as they wake up, you've got to stop doing what you're doing and put your attention back on the, the child. Mm -hmm. Well, when we're asleep, it's like the kids are, it's like the kids are asleep. Mm. And the unconscious part of your mind is sorting everything out. Um, and it's, and that's, that's why we have some strange dreams. Mm. 
because your body will or your mind will create a funny story mm. to help it process. Mm. And when it loses control of the story, um, because it's too emotive, perhaps, that's when it turns into a nightmare. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Wow, wow, wow. Um, it is, it really is fascinating. So let's talk about um life coaching. So I've I've personally never understood what life coaches are. Okay. And the reason is like there's so many variables to life. Yeah. You know, what does a life coach do? What problems do they solve? You know, so so how would you position a life coach? I would say it goes back to the answer being within the client Mm. or the person I'm working with. So I don't come up with the answer for them. Mm. I come up with some strategies to help them find the answer within themselves. Mm. And it's a little, and and the reason I got into life coaching was I was getting inquiries from people who were saying, I don't want, I don't want to take up my past with counseling. I don't like the idea of that. And I I don't really want to be put into a trance. Mm. I just want some, some tools going forward. So I don't keep on falling down the same potholes. Mm-hmm. Like I always, well, it's like the same records and the jukebox gets played. It jumps every single time at the same place. Mm-hmm. I just want to get past that. So we figure out where they are and where they want to be. And we start building the road. Mm. And that can be, I had a great saying the other day and it was, um, it was let go or get dragged along. Mm. And sometimes with the, and, and the three strands of therapy that I do, they make very good cousins yeah. and, and good dance partners. So I'm bobbing and weaving all the time with the clients that I help. But sometimes for them to make progress, you've got to let go of something. And that can be painful if it's familiar. Mm. It doesn't make it wrong, but it can make it strange. Wow. Wow. Okay. It makes sense. So they're, they're almost skill sets to help your customers get the outcome they want, depending on what those problems are yeah like, like one of them is a, as a giveaway for anyone watching this if you want to do something and you really want to do it stop thinking of why you can't mm. because thinking of reasons why you can't do something is never going to get you there instead I'd say, I'd say get a pen and paper out and make a list of why you can do this you know whatever whatever that is is you know you want to get fit you want to have a better quality of life you want a better job you want to run your own business, whatever you want to learn to play guitar, whatever it is, get a pen and paper out and start writing down a list of all the reasons of how you can mm-hmm. and refuse to think of why you can't. And if a reason why you can't comes up, bin it. You have the ability to reject things that come in your head. And when you chew, I was, I was, I mentioned this yesterday to someone else. Think about one of them old fashioned radio stations. You know, all these different frequencies that you've got to turn the dial for. You just got to turn this to the right frequency. And you, and, and the more you turn it, you, the static will become less. At some point, you'll hit the sweet spot. You'll probably overcorrect because you haven't done this before. And the static will kick in and you'll think, oh, I'm gone. I'm getting this. I've got to dial back. And you tune yourself back in to the sweet spot. And then you're on track. Amazing. You make those yeah. marginal corrections as you keep progressing forward, right? You're going to bump into yeah. walls. You're going to go the wrong way. But as long as yeah. you keep making those corrections, you're going to you're going to arrive. Absolutely. Amazing. Awesome stuff. Okay, so that, now we know um, what you do currently. Uh, you know, counselling, mm-hmm. hypnotherapy, and also life coaching. Yeah. Who is your typical customer? Because I'm thinking you're telling me this, and I'm thinking I've got golf clubs in the back there. And <laughs> could you make me a better golfer? You know, <laughs> can you can you put people in a trance to make them think differently when it comes to the sport or you know, you know, who is your typical customer? Is it someone who's got PTSD or any other issue? Well, um, I haven't niched with golf, but I do know someone who does. And if you want me to put in touch with you, please, please so you do. can become a ninja golfer. <laughs> yes, please do. I've got to beat James White. That's what I've got to do. <laughs> just turn up the blindfold and just you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, um, sorry, I lost, I lost track. So my ideal customer. So generally it's, um, and this is very generalizing, but generally it's women. Okay. Also, why is that? I think women are more open. And again, this is all generalizing. I think women are more open to say, I'm struggling with something. Can you help me out? I think um, generally some guys don't like, it makes them feel vulnerable to say, I'm struggling. Will you help me out? Mm. Um, depending on what the issue is that they're presenting with, 
but women are more accepting. So my, um, the normal customer that I see is a woman aged between 35 to 55. And she's either suffering from a uh, low confidence or anxiety or depression or this issue with um, relationships. There's a lack of self-belief mm. within herself. And what we have to do, depending on which way we're working, counseling, hypnotherapy or life coaching, we're going to have to look at some of them earlier lessons mm. and question the validity. Um, because we know we, we, when we're born, we're, we're born a blank canvas. Mm. And we only become the people we become because of the lessons we learn. Now, not all them lessons were correct. Mm. And until you look, you know, what's, what's behind the curtain of this, and start thinking, well, I'm not, this thing I'm believing, I'm not entirely sure that's, that's right. Now I'm a bit older, a bit wiser. Yeah. And when you, when you start looking at this, you think, actually, I've just discovered something. And because of that, I don't have to hold that view anymore. Mm. So you become a better version of yourself because you've realized something about yourself and then you can become a newer version of you of you it's lovely i love it but that it's amazing it's it's, it's so relatable as well you know uh, i wrote about this in in both books but we get taught to you know go to school get good mm-hmm. grades go university you know get a mortgage you know and then get married and um essentially get a pension right that was the traditional way of thinking the yeah. only r- wrong way of thinking with that is that that's great for our grandfathers and grandmothers but the the world's moved on right yeah and it reminds me of the, the film the matrix have you seen the matrix where yeah. it takes the red pill and this new world and that's what yeah. i felt like when i started questioning everything from my teachers to things yeah. that my parents told me to you know people who were close to me at, at the time um, it just wasn't in alignment mm-hmm. that I saw other people living a life that I wanted to live. Yeah. And for me, it was a big wake up call. And I went uh, away from the status quo and just went for the path that I wanted to see me achieve what I saw others achieving with the life yeah. I wanted for myself. Um, what happens in that moment for your customers when you, They've, they've got this conditioning growing up. They've got this condition through marriages and experience they've had in their life. And then all of a sudden yeah. you unwrap these lessons that aren't essentially true. What happens? Is it like a, like a, wow, like a freeing feeling? Is it an emotional feeling for them or do people react differently? The Iraq, first of all, congratulations to yourself because you're doing that. That's why you're winning mm. because you're not following the crowd and you, you know, you're making your own path. That's why you're winning. Um, and it would have been easier to have stayed with the crowd. Mm. It's hard to, to differentiate yourself from that. Um, so, you. And, and you are winning. And I know you're winning. And all, all power to you. <laughs> Thank you. Because, because it's the way it is. Appreciate it. Um, when I help clients with this, it's, have you ever seen one of them nature films where a flower turns towards the sun? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like that when they realize something within themselves that they didn't realize before and they become something they weren't before. I liken it a little bit to, it's a bit like a ship trying to leave a harbor and all the chains are still there, Mm. you know, and it's, it's when, it's when they break the links of their chains that might've been there for a very long time and I'll help them. And, and, you know, when they get tired, I'll be sore (laughs) with them, you know, and I'll be saying, come on, you've got this. It's just spurring them on. And when they get, and we're not stopping until we get through everyone. Mm. And when they do, then is that like, I'm going, I can feel the ships moving away from the the port. This is, Mm. this is a bit bizarre. And then they speed up. Amazing. Because they want more of it, right? And then they never go back. Mm. Lovely. I love it. Yeah. And and I, you know, you've found that with, with, people have a shift success once you know about this new world it's very hard to go back and it is again like the film the matrix you once you're in you know you can't go back to the old way of living because you know what else is out there um do you feel like these lessons and uh, that your clients have that have been conditioned with them is generationally passed on so from their parents they've been taught their grandparents taught them because you know robert kiyosaki said you know, poverty is passed on through generations. It's, it's a hereditary. With yourself, have you found these lessons have been passed on? Um, 100%. Hmm. Um, and I think it's important to say as well, they might have been passed on with the best of intentions. Yeah, of course. You know, so, so it might be a parent, you know, I love you so much, I'm going to tell you all I know, but they might have a limit in belief 
embedded in there somewhere. Mm. You know, who, that's not for the likes of you. Uh, stop living in fantasy land. Who Janelle Snow has done this? Just get a job, keep your head down. Mm. Can you get your wage, get your pension, get your wife, get your husband, die. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, you are extremely passionate about what you do, and it shows with the work that you do with your clients. Um, what do you love the most about it? What do you love the most about business? You know, you, you, for you personally. About my business. Yeah, about your business and what you do. Um, it goes right back to my core values. Um, I hate bullies. Mm. I hate people who put people down. Mm. And I think it's really sad when someone I'm working with, no one else has to say a word, they're putting themselves down and mm. they're not being who they should be. And for them to break free from that, because first of all, they have a desire to and a, a hope that they can. But when they manage to do so and they become free, it is wonderful. Truly. Amazing. I can, I can tell you can be massively yeah. passionate about it. Um, what, okay, so obviously we talked about the nice things and business and how great it is. And um, yeah. we have challenges as business owners, right? As entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. For you, what's kind of been the biggest challenge for you, do you reckon? Um, the biggest challenge for me, it was realizing that for the first time ever, I was going to work for myself and I didn't have a bloody clue how to do it mm. and do it in any way. Because the alternative, I couldn't, I couldn't bear. So I was going in. I wouldn't say, I'd say f- f- to run in a business was blind for me. And I'd be asking other people and watching webinars and listening to podcasts and what would you do and what do you think and this kind of stuff. But that's been the hardest bit for me, really, because the passion and the desire to do it has never, n- never failed at all. It's always been there. Um, but that was the hardest thing. It was doing it on my own. Mm. You know? Okay. Amazing. Amazing. Um, with regards to, because uh, there's a lot obviously counselors out there in the world in general and hypnotherapists, et cetera. Um, what do you think makes you different? What, what, you know, what stands you away from the competition? Do you think? I think, I think there's, there's a few things. I think first of all, my background, mm. um, Everyone who's been watching this, we've all seen stuff we shouldn't see. Mm-hmm. And we've seen a lot of it. <laughs> and we've, we've sat with people who are in bits and broken. And we've watched videos and seen images. And, you know, we've, when everyone else was running that way, we've run that way. Mm. And that is very, very unusual for people to experience that. It, puts us, it definitely puts us in the minority. I bring the resilience and the strength from that into my existing business. I also bring the knowledge of what's at the end of the tunnel into my existing business Mm. because as well as the victim of walk their walk, I've walked my walk with them Mm. to a lesser degree because it happened to them. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen, sadly, some friends and colleagues suffer because they didn't get the help they needed. Um, And I've seen them suffer in quite a bad way and sometimes fatally as well. So, what I'm bringing to the table is I know down to my core that you have the ability within you to do virtually anything you want to do. And the stuff you've been told as a child is probably been a lie that you don't even realize. And you've got a genius ability within you in between your two ears. And I want to help you unpick it. So you become unstoppable with what you want to go for. And you should, you know, become the director of your own movie, literally the director of your own movie. And that's one of the reasons I left the police. I realized that it was my ship, but I was on the oar below deck, rowing, like, occasionally looking at the little hole where the oar go, occasionally seeing the sunlight. And I thought, no, sod this, I'm not doing this. So mentally, I, I got myself out, I went up, I, I, kick the captain off the ship and said, it's my bloody ship. Mm. And I'm deciding where it's going. And I'm saying it's going that way and no one's stopping me. And we can all do that. Truly, we can all do that. And we can do it in a kind way and a clear, with a plan. All you need is a plan. That's all you need, just a plan. Amazing. Absolutely inspirational. And you mentioned some of the, what makes you different is your background in the police. And I want to go on to police skill set. So, 
I speak to a lot of police officers. Uh, I speak to a lot of public sectors, nurses now, and you know, teachers and stuff. And they feel that they haven't got the skill sets. They go for another job. They don't get the job because they're either underqualified or they're overqualified. So they're yeah. very niche into their skill set. And as we know, because you're a part of Shift Success, we have these amazing members who have got these remarkable skill sets, which I hope other people in the public sector will start to understand they have as well. Yeah. And what I don't want people to do is base their salary on the value they get to bring, right? Their value, what they have as people, as individuals are much bigger mm -hmm. than what they're being paid. For you, you touched on something, your skill set and background in the police that's helped you in business, which is great. Yeah. And what I got from that is that you have empathy of the things you've got been through with victims yeah, uh, yeah. emotional intelligence the ability to calm people down and you know say things in a slight way your communication um which has all helped you in business yeah what other skill sets do you believe have, have helped you um in business from your previous experiences being a police officer i would say there's loads and i'd say everyone who's listening to this has also got them without exception so it's not i'm better than you i'm not better than anybody the skills that I've got, you've got. You'll have talked a victim into staying on board when she wants to drop it or he wants to drop it. You'll have encouraged them to go to court. That's sales, that's communication, that's empathy, that's passion. You'll have got a case file together to present to court. That's planning, that's organizational skills, that's faith. You'll have seen it through to the end. You'll have maybe spoken to a young person on the street and tried to encourage them to not do the things they're doing because there's something more in them. Again, that's passion, that's faith, all these skills that you've got. This is another one of the lies. You know, we were talking before about when we're growing up, mm -hmm. um, we might get told something by our parents that when we question it, it's actually not entirely accurate. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things I hear in, when I was in the police was that I can't do nothing else. I haven't got the skills. Mm. And that is absolute rubbish. You've got more skills and the people who are listening to this have got more skills than you realize and you can nail it. All you got to do, if you find something you're passionate about and you think of how you can and you get a plan and you get like-minded people and you bring that passion and that goal set and that organization, that communication. So I'm getting passionate myself talking about it. It's good. Carry on. <laughs> and you bring that to the party. That's a nice cocktail. And, and I, I, I talk a lot in stories and I think if I want to get offered a cocktail of this cocktail, your pension might, might get taken from you or messed around with, and you might get attacked or abused and your mental health may suffer. You can drink from that one or you can drink from this one and it's going to be hard, but you're going to be following your passion and your dream and getting paid what you're worth and being the captain of your own ship. What one do you want to drink out of? I'm drinking out of this one every day every time i'm never drinking out the other one anymore ever and no, no one else has to either i'm not against the police i'm against the way the organization treats its staff mm. Mm. you know in the met i don't know what it's like in other forces in the met you log on with your number not even your name mm. you what well people feel like they're just <laughs> <laughs> you log on with your number and and you know maybe you've got to experience hands and you notice in and your kit like a drug dealer in an underground car park <laughs> you know i don't know but for god's sake you've got the you've got so much ability within yourself to do something more and be more you've got it mm. you've got it. it reminds me of that have you seen that picture where there's an elephant that's attached to a chair like yes. a, a plastic chair and it reminds me of you know they have this all this power this ability this this skill essentially yeah to be able to just walk away to freedom mm -hmm. but because they've been conditioned through the job and the years of growing up as people they feel yeah. like they're going to be tied to that chair forever and that's why the elephant doesn't escape even yeah. though it could crush the chair and Easily. escape to freedom uh, it reminds me of like do you, do you agree to that absolutely absolutely and it's it's again yeah you, if, you, if you get out and it's going to be hard it's going, to, it's going to be hard for people to think, well, I don't know, you know, where's the money going to come from? I haven't got the tools. You have got the tools. You don't need the money yet. You haven't made the decision. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you no, know, yeah. just make the, the decision comes first. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Um, 
so you obviously you've been with shift success about less than six months and i know you're yes. currently through your journey what's changed for you so far and you know in a, in a year's time i'd love to have a second interview with you to see where you're at but for you so far what's kind of changed for you personally and professionally since joining um well <laughs> i'm definitely not an unconscious incompetent anymore <laughs> You know, that, that was a painful lesson to learn, but, you know, it, it was a lesson for the better. Um, I'm more structured, I'm more focused, um, and with like-minded people. And that in itself is, is awesome. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times in the police, a lot of people are saying, oh, I'd love to go, but, you know, what can you do? And it, that, that, that's like a bit of a negative vibration, really. Mm -hmm. But uh, shift to success it's completely positive everyone is like your biggest cheerleader and if anyone's I've, i know i've found if i've ever if ever i've had a question and i've put it on the facebook group for instance immediately answers are coming in i've even seen you do it for other people where you've got on and done a video for them for the whole community it's uh, my prices have gone up um it's just everything is just you know using a bit of analogy is that the little samurai sword and it's all getting sharpened up mm. for all the right reasons and all the right way it's great amazing and also obviously people can't obviously listen to this podcast and watching this right now uh, don't know actually your skill set in your ability to sell and solve problems um yeah, yeah. and that's for everyone listening you know if you're not making sales in your business you you haven't got a business for you yeah. you've really took to that i can see how you develop that skill set what do you enjoy most about about sales um, I enjoy taking someone on a bit of a journey, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it, and I can't stand cheesy spammy sales. So we just have a chat mm -hmm. and I say, okay, how can I help? They'll tell me what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And I'll be thinking, okay, I'm like a, a bit like a swan, but on the outside, it's all nice and calm, but underneath the water, my feet are going and my mind's thinking, okay, we could try this. We could try that. We could definitely do that. This would work. We'd stay away from this one. And it's just helping people find that they can do something and I can help them get to where they want to get to. Mm. And it's, um, and I enjoy the collaboration really, because that's what it is. There's a know. team effort, right? You're working as a team to get to your result for your client. Yeah. And it's, and it's all, and you know, and when you used to get working together and the faith and the trust builds up and then that bond becomes even closer because you're making more and more progress together and then you're picking up speed mm. it's amazing. Great. amazing amazing stuff um what's kind of been a key highlight for you since you've left the police and you've gone into business what's kind of one moment special moment that's happened in your entrepreneurial career that has just made you feel i don't know warm inside happy and you know joyful because it happened oh this there's been a few. Um, <laughs> recently, um, recently, there's been a few things popped up on, like a memory on Facebook from when I've put a post on from when I was in the police. And I'd put a post, something like, I've just done a 20 hour shift. I've had four hours sleep and I'm going back in. I feel like I've been hit with a big stick for a long time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it makes them, and it reminds me of them times thinking I'm never doing that again, you know? And it's, it, it, I don't know, it's a difficult one, Alex, because it's so subtle, mm. really. It's the things like, I'm never going to have to ask anyone for a day off again. Mm. I'm never going to have to have my year planned in advance. I'm never going to miss an event. Mm. I'm never going to miss my children's birthdays. Mm. You know, I'm never going to miss an anniversary. If, if there's a, not with COVID at the moment, but if there's a party and I say I'm going, unless I'm poorly, mm. I'm going. You know, there's not, there's no, it's, it's as if everything's just coming in harmony. It's the freedom aspect. Yeah. And, and it's, and when you become the captain of your own ship, it is, it is brilliant. I, I feel, you know, that clip from Braveheart with Mel Gibson, like freedom. <laughs> and it's, it's very much like that. And I've never regretted it once leaving, not once. Amazing stuff. What's your um, vision for the future? Where do you see yourself and your company going in the future, where do you want to be? I want to be known as the as the go-to guy to go to. <laughs> I love that. Okay. You know, and, and I want to do it in a number of different ways. So one of the ways is seeing clients one-to-one. -one. one is working like a business to business. Another one is selling uh, books that I've written, which I've already started. 
Another one is my, my YouTube channel up to speed, a Facebook um, group started, given as much quality as I can that people can test me out and think, I think this guy knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. This this stuff works. And then I, I wonder what it'd be like to, to work with him. So that might be courses I'll develop. I just, I want to help as many people as I can. And I can do it now with no restrictions, unless I restrict myself. Amazing. Absolutely amazing stuff. I have no doubt you, you're absolutely going to get there. I, I know it. Um, if someone's watching this, uh, yeah. just like you, I'm going to use you as an example. A lot of people say, oh, I can't build a business. I've got kids. I can't build a business. I've got a mortgage. I can't build a business because I've got a pension or a wife or every excuse you can possibly imagine. Um, yeah. Even though the job is destroying them, they're unhappy, right? The shift success is not about you know, anti-job. It's about you know, pro happiness, pro choice. Yeah. If the if the if the job is ruining you, um, what would you say to someone who wants to change their lives, but they feel like they can't because they've got these things going on in their lives and they're spinning too many plates? Because you've been a husband, you've got kids, yeah. you've had a pension, you was in the job for many many years. Yeah. What would you advice would you give to them based on your own story? If they said I can't do it because I've got a mortgage, I'd say that's why you should do it. I can't, I can't, I can't do it because I've got kids. That's why you should do it. Because you can, you can. Everything's got a flip side. Mm. You know, you can look for reasons why you can't, to look for reasons why you can. What I would say is, do you want to be like Bob? <laughs> you know, don't be like Bob. <laughs> yeah, be like you. Be like you. Whatever you're. Got. Everyone's got a dream. I mean, a mentor of mine told me once. Everything you, everything you, anyone's ever done or anything that you've ever done, it's gone through three stages. It's gone through the fantasy. And then you made it into a theory. And then you made it into your reality. Mm. So the fantasy at the moment could be, oh, I'd love to leave the police, but I don't know how. Okay, well, then move into the theory. Get a pen and paper. How could I do this? Could I, could I go for something I want to do? Have I got to get trained first? Is there a course I need to do? Is there a qualification? Is there a skill set? Whatever it is. And I would encourage anyone, I mean, truly, and I'm not getting paid to say this, I would encourage anyone to join Shift to Success if you're the right kind of person who's thinking, I'm not stopping until it's done and I'm going to have support of people around me because these guys and girls will help me nail it because that, that is the truth. They do. And I love it. <laughs> I appreciate I truly, it. I, I do, Alex, I really do. No, I appreciate that, James. You know, if you're flying, it's good. It's good to see. And, um, you know, we appreciate the kind words, not just me, but I know the team do as well. Um, one of the last questions I ask everyone who's been invited to the podcast is yeah. um, something that always intrigues me. And I know it intrigues the audience through the comments that we get on the podcast. But what does entrepreneurship mean to you? For me, it means... finally becoming the captain of your own ship as you should and only you should be the captain of your ship absolutely a 